<laughs> Good morning. Um, welcome to the Ethical Humanist Society. Uh, thank you for joining us, whether in the auditorium or on YouTube. My name is Sherry Pollack, and I'm a member of the Society and co-chair of the Sunday Program Committee, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, many of you know that we uh, like to start with um, either you know, a short quote or definition of humanism to help build a better shared understanding of who we are as a community and what humanists believe in. So today I'm going to share with you this short and sweet definition from the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism or other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. Our programs address a wide variety of topics, including current events, philosophy, arts, and sciences, to name just a few. Today's program is part of our ongoing programming related to the world of work. So we are pleased to have with us today Paula Epstein. Paula has a master's degree in library and information science and spent many years working as a librarian and college instructor. In 1997, she began volunteering at a hospice, which then led to her training as a certified nursing assistant and most recently as an end-of-life doula. She has spoken to a number of classes and groups about hospice and death and appeared in Let's Talk, a De Let's Talk About Death Baby, interviewing an end-of-life doula in the podcast Evan the Counselor Live. We're happy to have Paula join us today. Thank you. Good morning. I thank you so much for having me here today and to be able to talk about something that has impacted my life greatly. Over my over 25 years of being a hospice volunteer, over 15 years as a certified nursing assistant, and now two years as a certified end-of-life doula, I have been asked many questions about death and dying and just what is it that I do. So I'm, today I'm going to talk about hospice and, and end-of-life doula, discuss, if we have time, palliative care and grief, and I'm going to start with hospice. Now what's really important to know is that I get questions all the time. Hospice, what is it? What services do you provide? Do I need it? Does that mean that the minute I sign up for hospice, I'm dead? Or I'm going to be dying shortly? Now with end of life doula, I hear just what is that? And so I, that's what I hope to achieve today, is to explain the differences and how there could be a symbiotic relationship between both hospice and utilizing and hiring an end-of-life doula. The term hospice comes from Latin, and it means hospitality. And this is an old concept. It goes back to the Crusades when people were traveling and on their journey, that what they would do would find oases or pockets of comfort and hospitality. The same thing with religious pilgrimages. They would perhaps stop at monasteries or again find other comfort stations to, to help navigate and continue on with your journey. And that's what hospice is. And I want you to think of it that way, is to give comfort. It's a holistic approach to patients and their families. It covers religious, spiritual, and, um, and physical aspects of your life. You have a complete interdisciplinary team when you sign up for hospice. You have a full complement of doctors, nurses, certified nursing assistants, caseworkers, clergy. You have volunteers. You have therapists, music therapists, music thanatologists. You have people who provide vigils. So that means that they're at the bedside when someone is actively dying. 
And at the end of life, for families, they give grief counseling. They provide medicine, they provide supplies, and they can even provide a bedside, you know, a um, hospital bed. So they can bring that into your home. You can have hospice many ways. You can have it at home. You can have it in a nursing home, an assisted living facility, even residential facilities within a nursing facility. You can also have it in a hospital because sometimes hospitals have wings or individual rooms that are set aside for hospice patients, or they can be in a freestanding hospice organization. To be hospice appropriate, your doctor has to say that you have a terminal disease, that you have less than six months to live. By stating that, that means that you can have, if you're a senior, Medicare Part A or your insurance pay for these services. Or, it, you know, um, it can state that you, um, excuse me, I'm losing my train of thought here. I have so much that I want to impart but that it's very important that you know that that six month does not mean that it is six months, that the minute you sign up for hospice, that you will die within that time frame. Dying and death is a, unfortunately or fortunately, it's, it's not an exact science. So some people do die within a matter of days, because perhaps they came late into the hospice experience, or the fact that um, people we've had hospice in for years, where every six months they get recertified. What's in, I'd like to give a little background into hospice. Once again, I mentioned that hospice has been around for a long time. Long time. Modern day hospice really started after World War II in England. There was a nurse, her name was Cecily Saunders, who actually is a fascinating woman if you read her history. She was working in England with Holocaust survivors and she realized that they needed something more than just medical care. They needed some social, psychological, spiritual, additional help in, in trying to heal them. So that's where the whole holistic approach comes in. She established the first hospice in England. She became a doctor and then she became a dame and she was knighted by the royalty at that time. Jumping ahead to the United States, in 1974, the first modern-day hospice was, uh, was set up in Connecticut. Since that first hospice, we have now close to 5,000 hospice organizations around the United States. There are close to 50 of them in Illinois alone. We have over a million doctors in the United States. We now have close to 7,000 who are hospice and palliative trained, and that's their specialty. We in our culture are not good about talking about death and dying. And by utilizing some of these services, we're working with this every day. We can talk about these. We can help alleviate some of your fears answer your questions, help to educate. And that is one of the additional benefits of being in hospice. You get to know somebody in depth. You get to know them right away because a lot of the barriers are down. Sometimes you are another set of ears because your family has heard all your stories. 
Sometimes they tell us very naughty stories, and I used to joke and say, oh boy, I could, I could really blackmail you because <laughs> I have so much information about you and your background. So that is kind of a, an aside of that. You get to know someone virtually immediately. Barriers are down. We can t comfortably talk about things that are on your mind. Doulas and the doula role. The whole premise of doula, and this is actually an interesting concept, they're midwives. They are people who serve. That's the definition of them. And we are to provide a service to you. We are to educate you, empower you, be patient, answer any of your questions for both you and your family. Again, it's a holistic approach. So death midwives is something that I'm going, that we are sometimes called. And midwives have been around since women have been giving worth, birth. They are coaches, they assist. And that's what a death doula does, a death midwife does. It's to be present during the final stages of a person's life. Some of the services that are provided, and first I want to say a couple of things before doing that, is that there is no government certification in that, in becoming a death doula. There are certain organizations and institutions that provide classes for it and certify you. So that is, and I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, there is no government regulation. That also means that you have to pay out of pocket. There's no Medicare, Medicaid, nor does insurance cover it. And as I go through some of the services, and why they can be very beneficial to you and your family, you'll see why there is a interconnection between a hospice and a doula and why you might even want to hire a doula to correspond with your using a hospice. Some of the things that I have personally done is take a, a patient to the doctor. So I drove them there. Remember, we live in a very global society. Our family, our loved ones might live in another state, they may live in another country, they may live a distance from you. Maybe they're very busy in their lives, that they work full time, they have families, so they can't give their loved ones the amount of time and care that they might need. So I was asked to take someone to the doctor for a doctor visit. They had a series of questions that they wanted to ask the doctor, so I wrote that down. When you are a patient and you're going into a doctor's office, you're nervous. You may not think of all the questions that you might have. You might not listen carefully as to what the doctor is saying. So I am there to ask the questions and take notes. And then when we get home, I can you know, discuss that again, explain again, and sometimes I have to go over things over and over and over, and then go back to the family with what the doctor has said. I use, whenever I go into a doctor's office with someone, I use the concept of BRAIN. It's an acronym. If the doctor is going to come up with a new treatment or there is a new trial, I ask, what is the benefit of that trial? That's B. R. What is the risks if we were to go through that trial or new treatment? A, what are, the, are there any alternatives other than this trial or that treatment or different medications? 
I. I, I hold off on until afterwards, and that's intuition. And then I will talk to the person and say, how do you intuitively feel about what you just heard, about this possible treatment or possible new medication? And then N, what if I do nothing? What if that person does nothing? What are the outcomes? So I use that concept for a doctor's visit. And then we can have discussions. Other things that I have done, and I want you to know that we do not proselytize. We don't give our opinion. It's not about us. It's about them. Sometimes you want to, or they decide they want to get their affairs in order. To hire an end-of-life doula, you do not have to have a DNR, a do not resuscitate. That's your choice. However, if you're in a hospice setting, you do have to sign off on a do not resuscitate. So this person may, wanted to get their affairs in order. So they asked me to get forms, which I did, on a DNR, on a will, so I got a boilerplate will on medical directives, an Illinois living will, power of attorney. So I was able to accumulate these forms, and then they and the family can fill them out. Now, sometimes they ask me if I want to you know, assist them, and I will just write what they say on these forms. So getting documentation is something that I have done. Mediating family squabbles. I was so naive when I first entered hospice. I thought that if people were having difficulty, they're estranged from a, from a child, estranged from a brother, a sister, a parent, that once someone has been di diagnosed with a terminal illness, everything magically changes and people come together. That doesn't happen. And I've seen that over and over. And sometimes we are there to mediate family issues. Perhaps one child has been the caregiver. And then all of a sudden, other children come in and then they give their opinion, they state what you know, what she did wrong, you would have done it differently, and really has given the caregiver a lot of grief. There is something called caregiver burnout. People who are caregivers are so involved, and it's a, an intense experience, and they can wear out. So it's important for them to sometimes have time off, and we can give respite giving them a set amount of time where they can go out, meet with friends, take in a movie, take a walk, go shopping without worrying. They're free to, to go and to rejuvenate. We are there to watch over their loved ones. In hospice, a situation that we had was two brothers were in the room with a, their dying mother and they started arguing, mom loved you better, mom did this, dad did that, and it got to almost where one of them was jumping over their mom's hospital bed because she, he was so angry at his sibling. We had to call security to break them up. So these situations happen. And what I ended up doing for some of the siblings and for other loved ones that they were having issues with, is I set up a timetable, a schedule, where different people came at specific times so that each one can enjoy being with their loved ones without interference and without anger. So that is another thing that I have done. Legacy. Legacy projects are huge in the end of doula experience and skill sets. Each doula has different skill sets. For example, 
in my class, we had a, someone from the clergy, we had nurses, we had hospice nurses, teachers, social workers, housewives, someone who experienced a loss and wanted to give back. So they come from a wide variety of fields. Now, people who gravitate to this profession, whether it's in hospice or end-of-life doulas, they have a certain affinity with people who are dying and are comfortable with them. And that is huge and something to remember and put in the back of your mind. You can ask them anything. You can talk to them about anything. I had a son-in-law and him and his wife were supposed to go on vacation and their mother was in hospice or his mother-in-law and he pulled me aside and he said, when is she dying already? She's in hospice. She's supposed to be dead. We have a vacation to go to. And we understand that. And we can listen to this. If he was to say that to someone else, he would sound really very negative and mean and hurtful. But we understand that, and we can explain and talk him through the process. Remember, dying is a very inexact science. We can't necessarily tell you when you're going to die, although we have become very comfortable in seeing a number of the signs and symptoms when someone is getting close to being actively dying. But we can't just tell you when that's going to happen. Boundaries. We keep boundaries. Confidentiality, alternative therapy. There were some people, some doulas, who are very comfortable giving, um, giving uh, aromatherapy or massage therapy. I have gotten information regarding funerals. One family was very environmentally concerned and they wanted to know all about green funerals. Which cemeteries have plots set aside in the Chicagoland area to have a green funeral? Compost funerals. Maybe you want to have a tree or a garden. Your loved one was a wonderful gardener. You're going to plant a tree in their honor. And you want to have compost from their remains put around that tree or those plants. So there is a compost. Um, and it, again, this is not in Illinois. But I gave them the various states that a body can be sent to to have the body composed. Cremation. Cremation is also a very critical. A lot of families believe in that. One person was upset. They didn't like the concept of fire and burning up their loved one's body. But there's something now called hydrocompost, hydrocremation where they use alkaline water, and you could send the body there. And then in a matter of time, the compost is sent back to you. The cremains are sent back to you. So these are some of the various things that I've done. Home funerals. Someone wanted to have a home funeral. They didn't want to use a funeral home. What this means is that the body is set up in a living room or a bedroom, and there are certain health issues that are involved around there, including dry ice, how much you have to use, etc. So I gave them the information and set them up with the Home Funeral Alliance to have that discussion, and then they made a choice as to whether they wanted a home funeral or not. Memorial services, again, something that I was able to assist. They wanted to have a memorial service before they died. 
they wanted to hear what people had to say about them. So I helped to set up something like that. Sometimes um, I've been asked to help, up, help with a, setting up for a shiva, things like that that we can do. Or in a funeral home to set everything up, you know, depending upon your religion and where you're going to have a meal or a get together. Feeding. I was asked to feed their loved ones. Now, when someone is with a terminal illness, their feeding habits change. Also, they may not swallow properly. So you have to be very careful when you're feeding someone. This person was in a nursing home. I've also done this on a unit. You have to be very careful how you feed someone. You do it slow. You have to make sure they're not pocketing the food in their cheeks. You have to make sure that they're swallowing carefully. It can take anywhere from one half hour to an hour to properly feed someone one meal. During that time, you may be touching them. You can be talking to them, etc. Well, as wonderful as hospices, nursing homes, etc., are, they don't have that luxury of time to spend with that person. So this is something an end-of-life doula can do, is to help feed, give you time. Legacy projects. Well, this is something I can tell you right off the bat. I have no skill sets in at all. I have no artistic talent. So they have asked people to perhaps journal for them, to videotape, perhaps oral history, family history, various stories that they wanted to leave behind for their family. Maybe they want them to um, set a, what they call a photo box, create photo images, whether it's in a collage or accumulate them and put them in a certain order. The same thing with recipes. This person may have been a fabulous cook and wanted to pass down their recipes. So these are some of the legacy projects that an end-of-life doula can do for you to help with various projects. Again, I do not proselytize. I don't tell people what to do. I am just there to support whatever decisions are being made by them or their family. I can't emphasize that enough. Some of the questions that I talk to uh, with, the, with patients or clients are, do you understand your illness? Do you need more clarity about that? Do you understand your symptoms? What their diseases, your prognosis, your diagnosis? I also ask them who is their primary caregiver and who is their power of attorney and their medical power of attorney. Because due to HIPAA, I cannot convey medical information to someone who is not one of the responsible members of the family who was given that power of medical attorney. So I need to know that. Some of the things that I've noticed over the years is that people are very fearful of dying. They don't want to die alone. They're very concerned about being a burden to their family. Financial information is huge. Talking about dying alone, I just want to interject this. And remember, we do vigils. I've done them for hospice. I've done them for end of life situations. I have been told, and I have actually witnessed this a couple of times, that mothers do not want to die before their die in front of their children. So sometimes they have waited until the family has left before they die and we can be with them at that time 
at, you know, after the family has left. A sense of touch. We have a tendency to feel uncomfortable touching someone who is dying. But that sense of touch is so important. One experience I had was with a younger man. He, he and I, we were sitting on a couch. We were reading, listening to music, and just talking. And he asked me to hold his hand, which I did. So we're sitting on the couch together, listening to music. He nodded off. Well, it was so comfortable, I have to admit, I nodded off also. And the two of us were leaning into each other, holding hands. His girlfriend walked in. Oh, she was furious. She was livid, as a matter of fact. It was a bit of an uncomfortable situation. And she says, how dare you hold his hand? He never holds hands. He hates holding hands. And I just went like this. And I said, take off your coat. And what I did was, I said, he asked me to do this. This is important to him. I want you to take my place. And he was still in a deep sleep. So she came. She sat next to him. She took his hand. And boy, did I run out of there quick. <laughs> but you know, these, these are situations that you come up with. You have to be creative and fast thinking about some of these. One legacy project I did do was with someone, a man, who was close to dying. And he had a essential other. And he is not, nor was, he was not effusive with his feelings and expressioning himself. He couldn't say, I love you, very readily. He asked me to write her a letter. So I was acting as a scribe. I wrote down all the things he felt and what he said, wanted to say to her. I didn't add anything to it except if he, you know, sentence structure, or perhaps he asked me, you know, about certain sentencing and whether to put a period or a new paragraph, things like that, that I could help with. So what I did was, when I got home, I got very nice paper and envelope. I wrote up what he had to say to her, how much he loved her, how much he appreciated, all the care he gave her throughout his illness, and what she meant to him. After I had left, a couple hours later, he apparently gave her that letter. She called me up and she said, Paula, I know you wrote this. There's no way he wrote this. He would not, he never said this. And I said, actually, he did. So you can ask, act as a scribe for them to help convey their, thing, their feelings. You can make phone calls. Is there someone you want to talk to? Is there someone you want to make amends with? Is there someone you want to say goodbye to? Do you want to talk to your lawyer? And sometimes, you know, they wanted to speak to their lawyer and have the lawyer come out and, you know, finish up the process of some of their documentation and have it on file. So I have made these types of phone calls for them. I never make assumptions. Once again, I cannot emphasize how much I'm non-judgmental because I hear all sorts of things. And it's not about me. I want to talk very briefly about palliative care. My mother is 100 years old, but she doesn't have a terminal illness. She has a chronic illness. She has had two strokes. And she is a fall precaution. She is palliative appropriate. I put her in. I volunteer for. I'm on the board of Journey Care. 
I put her in Journey Care's palliative program. What does that mean? That means that someone came out and assessed her. They had a nurse who came out there. They took all her vital signs, they took her weight. Weight is important, and I'll explain in a moment. After they were through with her that day, they go back to the office. They found that she is palliative appropriate, which means that it's paid for by Medicare or Medicaid, but Medicare Part B. Insurance can also pick up the costs. The nurse comes out every couple of months to reassess her and to check her, recheck her vital signs and see if there is a difference in her weight. When people have chronic or terminal diseases, their eating habits change. There may be something called failure to thrive. So that means that their, their weight may go down, and this is a trigger and something to look out for. What's also important about this is that if my mother declines, she is immediately, immediately put into hospice care with the complete complement of the interdisciplinary team. I don't have to wait. She doesn't have to wait for care. They're on it immediately. So this is a precursor to hospice so that you can seamlessly go into it if your condition changes. Grief. Grief is, more, am I okay? Grief is more than emotions, thoughts, and feelings. It is a process after we experience a loss. It can affect you physically, mentally, emotionally, socially. You can stop interacting with people. All of your relationships may be different. Your understanding about life may have changed. Because why was this person taking care of me, especially if someone dies young? What was the purpose? And I feel, and I'm going to repeat this at another time, is at some point family members should go under bereavement, counseling, grief therapy. All hospice organizations provide that service. And I think it's important for you to take advantage of it. You don't know when grief is going to affect you. It can affect you virtually immediately. It could be weeks from the time someone has passed. It could be months. It could be years. Maybe it's re-triggered because all of a sudden you hear a song that was your song. You go to one of your favorite restaurants or eat a food that was something that you both enjoyed. So these triggers can affect how you look at life and how you respond to your feelings. And I feel it's exceptionally important to get grief counseling at some point during your journey. There are various levels of grief. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, again, a very interesting woman, wrote The Five Stages of Death and Dying. It's a premier book um, on death and dying. The various stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Do they all happen in that order? No, not necessarily. It can happen at different times, different stages, not at all. But this was a premier book in helping to document what was going on in the death and dying experience. Later on, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and her student, David Kessler, again, another fascinating personality. David Kessler has 
written a lot of books about grief. And they're wonderful, easy reads. And there is so much information that it imparts to you. And I recommend him highly. In the back, um, I left a cheat sheet of some of the books. And believe me, it is a very short cheat sheet. <laughs> Um, of some of the books that could be helpful to you in reading up on death and dying. So what did Kubler-Ross and David Kessler say? Well, they took the five stages of grief and they put a timeline to it. Once again, I just want to state that this is an inexact science. The various stages of grief are not only something that can affect you right away, but you may be skipping some, you may not have some of them, you may have all of them at different periods of time. So what are the levels of grief? The first one is phase one, denial. That can be within one or two weeks of losing your loved one. You're stunned, you're in disbelief, you have a short attention span, there's confusion, perhaps impaired functioning and impaired decision making. You just can't seem to get it together. Phase two, there's anger. This can last anywhere from week two to four months. You're angry that that person has left you and left you alone. You may be restless, difficulty sleeping, weight loss, perhaps even weight gain. You're resentful, and perhaps you just don't have any strength to function. You may be, even be experiencing some physical heart palpitations, headaches, etc., because you are so involved in your anger. You are just so angry at that person for leaving you. Phase three, bargaining. This can be from the fifth month to the ninth month, where you feel like you're going crazy. You may be fatigued, forgetful, have eating issues, become, again, disorganized. Phase four is depression. And that can last anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Again, all of these symptoms about not being able to function and not being able to communicate with other people or express what they need, or sometimes you communicate too much and people are a little bit tired of hearing it and they tell you, just get over it. That is not a helpful thing to say. Phase five, acceptance, and that can come at any time. Phase five is that you start to sleep better Perhaps you can now laugh or smile, interact with other people, you engage more, and you can actually see a future for yourself, albeit a different future, but you are finding that there is a future for yourself. David Kessler came up with a six phase, and he calls that meaning. You find meaning in your life. You become empowered. This has perhaps changed you, altered you. You may now start volunteering somewhere. You've become more engaged. Perhaps you want to speak out, etc. So finding meaning can really be huge, and it might even bring you closer to your loved one. I want to go back for one minute and talk about the Death Cafe. At the Oak Park Public Library, and you have to register for this, every month they have end-of-life doulas and other health practitioners come in and talk about death and dying. So, the, so they have it where you can come in and ask your questions. So that could be another resource for you. It's important for me to know just what it is you and your family needs. 
you, and to encourage people to ask for help. Sometimes we are not able to ask for help or uncomfortable to ask for it. But it's very important, and that's why hospices and end-of-life doulas are there. I also want to talk about how do you hire an end-of-life doula. There are a couple of organizations in NELDA, NELDA, as well as the University of Vermont, although their website is a little hard to navigate. And other uh, private organizations which do the training, which have directories of people who've gone through their certification prom, a program. You can also Google it to see end of life in your community and find who is there. Interviewing them, and this is huge. If you are gonna hire someone, and remember, it's out of pocket costs. It can cost, and I'm asked this a lot, anywhere from 20 to $50 an hour. It, you can buy by legacy project, which could be maybe $150 per project, or you can buy by complete hire, I should say, by complete service. And that can be $1,500 and up. When you are interviewing an end-of-life doula, a couple things that I would recommend. Number one, write down what services you want. Have that handy. Then you can compare it and ask that doula or death midwife, what are your skill sets? And do they correspond with what you need? Can you negotiate any of them, etc.? What are your costs? How do you want to be paid? Do you have liability insurance? Is there any refunds? If I bought for a complete service and my loved one didn't last more than a couple of days, I also want to know if they are available 24-7. Can I call them at any time when I notice something a little bit different in their status or how they're breathing and have them come over? Do you have a backup? Because with a, uh, excuse me, with a hospice situation, remember, you have a complete interdisciplinary team you have a 24-7 phone number you can call to get medical personnel to come out immediately. Do you have more than me as a client? And that could be huge because if you feel that you want them to give you more of the attention to your loved one, you want to know if they are available to you. I want to know how the patient is coping. I want to know how the family is coping. I want to know what are some of your proudest moments? Do you have any regrets? And we can talk about all of this. Again, I like what David Kessler said, is that you can't heal what you can't feel. And like I said, he had a very interesting story because besides writing all the books, he suffered many losses, including the death of his son due to an overdose. So he knows from what he speaks of. He can, emphasize, em, he can empathize with you and your family. So his books, I feel, are very comforting and important. Some of the things that I have learned, and I'm asked over and over, is people don't want to die alone. Again, they don't want to be a burden. They don't want to linger. And these are some of the things that I have learned since being a part of this journey in my life. 
I have learned to be a better person, or I've tried to be. I try to have fewer regrets and laments in my life. I try not to beat myself up with all the, if I only would have, if I could have, I should have. I try not to think about those things. I am who I am. I'm trying the best that I can. I say I love you with more regularity and comfortably. I want to have time to be able to say my goodbyes. I learned gratitude, to be thankful for other family members and friends, good friends, who are your chosen family, to thank them for being a part of my life. This one I haven't mastered. Uh, to forgive those who have harmed you. I'm not quite there at that one yet. But anyways, to forgive or ask for forgiveness for, to somebody you may have harmed inadvertently or perhaps you, just, you harmed them. I think it's very important that you, at this stage of your loved one's life or yourself, have a full complement of people who can be there for you and can assist you. You shouldn't be alone during this stage of life. And I want to thank you so much for allowing me to be here. So I have gratitude to this organization, and I thank you. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. Um, we are going to pause before Q&A for our musical interlude. Um, during this time, we um, will be virtu virtually passing the basket, um, and contributions can be made at our website. The link will be posted in the YouTube chat for those of, uh, those of you who are joining us virtually. Um, our in-person audience um, can drop something in the basket on the back table or um, scan our QR codes that are posted around the room. Um, it is, of course, through our generosity that we show how meaningful our Sunday programs are. We suggest a donation of $5, but whatever you are um, comfortable giving is um, greatly appreciated. And then we will come back in a few minutes with um, Q&A. And um, so start thinking about your questions. Our in-person audience will come up to the mic. And um, if you're joining us online, please post your questions in the chat.
All right, again, if you have questions, please post them in the chat or come up to the microphone if you are here in the room with us. While that is happening, Can I ask a question from here? Oh, yeah. our YouTube audience will be able to hear, so we can, well, everybody will hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, they will. <laughs> um, I, my question is, is, how do you find a good hospice? That is a good question. Can it's you like repeat asking. For people online? Will you repeat it since oh. people online will hear Certainly. Thank you. Certainly. The question is, how do you find a good hospice? I'm going to liken it to taking your child to various colleges and trying to find a college that's a right fit for you. It's very hard to say. Even going around looking at numerous nursing homes, assisted, um, assisted living facilities, etc. As much as I love my hospice, and I have great admiration for the people who work there, I don't care what hospice you use. What's important is that you use them for the person that you love. It's very hard to say. When you go on a unit, or if you go in a hospital, and you see that someone isn't being well taken care of, that there are smells, that people are on the call button all the time, you know that there may be a bit of an issue. I always ask the question, what are your services and how many people do you have on staff? What is your ratio from staff to the person, to the patient or the client? And I think that that's important. I think that we find out that it's only as good as the last time you visited someplace, yeah, unfortunately. And in this day of COVID, a lot of people aren't going out to seek that. So when you are asking your questions, you can look to see if reports, because this is government documented, and Illinois State will have a report card, because they come in to evaluate all the different hospices and services. So I would also recommend that. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you've ever, you have a favorite hospice client that you've dealt with in the past. Oh, thank you for asking that. I've had many, but a couple that really have in, I really enjoyed tremendously was there was a hospice patient and I would see her all the time. And she would convey to me that the only thing, and she was in her 90s, the only thing she wanted was her daughter to be married. Her daughter was in her 60s. She wanted her married. She wanted her settled. This was primary on her mind. And the daughter and I became friends. And after the mother passed away, we would get together for coffee every now and then. Well, the daughter met someone. And she was having a wedding. And she asked me to be the stand-in for her mother. How touching was that? that? That meant a lot. Another favorite is one of my very early ones. Being a college art librarian, I was very f familiar with uh, tattoo and body art. And I've ordered a lot of books on that. On our unit, there was a young man who had an exceptionally alternative lifestyle. He, was, he had HIV, he was actively dying, and he was morose. No one could talk to him, he didn't want to be bothered, he wanted to be let alone, he was aggressive, etc. Plus he was estranged from his family. So they sent me in as a volunteer if I would sit with him and try to calm him down. Well, if anyone has talked to me with any period of time, you know I can be very boring. So anyways, I was talking to him, and we were, we were, I was reading something, and he needed to be changed. And as a certified nursing assistant, I was very able to assist with them to changing him. And all of a sudden, because he had blankets and sheets up to there, 
I saw this phenomenal tattoo work on him all over his body. I said, wait. And I lifted his leg. I said, you got to turn over. I said, that looks like spider webs work. It was very intricate, colorful artwork. He looked at me, he says, you know Spider Webb? I said, I don't know him, but I know of his work. He says, he was my friend. He did all his artwork on his body. So after that, whoa, it was like uh, we were the best of buds. Also, what was good about that is that we talked about the estrangement um, in his family. His father has remarried, and we had the uh, ugly stepmother syndrome. So we called the father in. I said, would you be willing to talk to your father? And he says, yeah, but not without the mm. Anyway, so I said, no, that's fine. So um, they called the father. They had him come in. And I stayed for two, with, for two hours with the stepmother while the son and the father became less strained and they reconciled with one another. So those are a, a couple of them. And uh, thank you for asking that. But I have many more stories, <laughs> believe me. Hi. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. My question is, and I think I heard you say this, but I'd like to have it repeated so I um, can understand it more for, uh, fully. Um, with regard to disposing the body after death, um, I am familiar with cremation. What about a person who doesn't want their body cremated? Is there a hydraulic? Yes, right, there is. And um, it's called hydrocremation. And it's done out of state. So the body is sent there. What happens is that they are put in a al into alkaline liquid and the body decomposes. And then the cremains are mailed back to you. So the answer is yes, there is. There's a lot of alternative things out there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm a health policy person and a hospice, longtime hospice oriented person, uh, and also the child of someone who died after a long lingering illness. And the thing that strikes me, and I'm curious if you have an insight, is the ignorance of smart, thoughtful people about how bodies die and what death, like human bodies, know how to die. And it sort of is a pretty understandable process. Sure. And the idea that you're withholding water or you're withholding is like, well, not really. His body doesn't need it anymore. That's and right. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how we can become just as a society, More. where does that information belong and why are we not learning okay. it better? Um, hospice is usually, at least my, my hospice does, provides a booklet about um, how can you tell if someone is actively dying. There are a lot of signs. Usually people stop eating. They're not interested in eating. And believe it or not, without food, and we have actually had someone believe it or not, it was a cousin of ours, who came into her husband's room and brought his favorite food. Well, he didn't want it. She started slapping him, trying to wake him up and tell him he has to eat because food gives you strength. Uh, we had to remove her also. But anyways, um, no, not necessarily. People can survive on liquid and you can get liquid several ways. We can put droplets of liquid to the side of the mouth and it slowly goes down. You can get liquid through medication, but, but you don't want to eat. You're not interested. You could choke if you eat. So some of the symptoms to look for are swelling, skin has changed, there may be modeling where the blood congeals. Their breathing has changed. So there is um, agonal breathing or Shane Stokes, where all of a sudden they're breathing, they stop breathing, etc. So you, and maybe they are glassy eyed, they sleep more, they're not communicative. So it's important to know that if someone has made a decision or are unable to eat anymore, leave them alone. 
they're telling you something. They just can't do it. And it's your, how you're dealing with it that is a problem. You mentioned something about children. I have limitations. I cannot work with children. I've done it. I'm not comfortable with it. It upsets me too much. And there is um, a very interesting book that is out there that can help to explain to children about uh, the, someone in their family who has died. As a librarian, I would be remiss if I wouldn't add extra books than the few that I wrote down. One of them that will tell you about end-of-life hospice is a work of fiction by Jody Picoult, The Book of Two Ways, where she is an end-of-life doula in a very nice story manner. It will tell you what a hospice does, end-of-life, excuse me, end-of-life doula does. I kind of like this one, Awakening from Grief. And this is telling you, again, how to find meaning in your life. And the last one I'm going to mention is I used to go pre-COVID to a lot of funeral services or memorial services. Don't do that now. And I realized I didn't understand a lot about different religions. And I made some errors in going to um, a, a different funeral with a different religion. And I like this one, how to be a perfect stranger. So how to act depending on, you can be Hindu, Baptist, Buddhist, it doesn't matter. It gives you guidelines on that. So I think that um, there is a lot of resources out there for you. This question comes from one of our YouTube uh, viewers. I drove a friend to visit her terminal mom in ICU. I noticed that anytime somebody held her hand, her pulse and blood pressure would gradually increase. One, is that normal? And two, if so, is this something that um, could be done to help delay death if, if loved ones need more time to get to the bedside? Yes, yes it can help, help. It can happen because you're excited to see someone, yes. We have something, and it's fascinating, called music thanatology. We have two musicians that play the harp, and the harp is kind of carved out so it goes into the bedside. What they do, and we've used it a lot for people with their pressure has been elevated, they're agitated, and agitation is another sign of someone who <coughs> may be actively dying. What they do is they take the vital signs and they play music, not songs that you know, not tunes that you may be familiar with, but they play music that corresponds with their breathing and their blood pressure. And we've had it where families, we've, they, where they've all been called in, uh, stood around the bedside, perhaps held hands while the music was playing, and it is amazingly calming. It is an incredible gift to have someone who can do that and to have that as part of the services. Is to not know a tune that you know, but to play along with your symptoms. Have you had uh, family members or patients uh, express interest to you in ways of hastening death? Yes. And, and do you have any personal feelings about that? Okay, remember my personal feelings don't count. But that is one of the, one of the questions I had with a family, not only with family members, but um, in my hospice experience. And I um, explored and found out all the different states that do assisted suicide. Illinois is not one of them. So then I found out what would it cost, what it would entail if you were to go to that state, and I have a list of them, and, and find a doctor there, take up residency for a period of time for evaluation to get an assisted suicide. So yes, I've had that question a lot. Illinois is not a state that does that. Uh, 
I'm not sure if this is an answerable question or not, but uh, I did have an experience with my mother some years ago. Uh, she spent less than one day in, in a, an official uh, facility. Um, and when she was transferred there, she was heavily sedated and not apparently conscious. Um, but we were there with my family, um, my wife and her grandchildren, um, and then left her in the evening because we didn't know any time frame. Could have gone another day or two. Um, and left with some music playing in the background on a boom box. <laughs> um, but within a couple of hours of getting home, we got the call that she had passed. And I'm just wondering, how conscious was she of her surroundings? And it's something I, I don't know the answer to, okay. and I don't know if there's an answer. I can tell you our stock answer, that people have a sense, have all their senses, but when they're actively dying, the last sense to go is hearing. Now, what's interesting about that, and I'll never forget it, and this will be appropriate for uh, my situation, is someone says, hearing? She can't hear it. She's deaf as a post. She has, uses hearing aids. What do you mean the last sense is, deaf, you know, is hearing? So, but that, that is what I have been taught over the years, that, again, the sense of touch, feeling, smell, but the last sense to go, so she probably knew that you were there, sensed that you were there, and heard the music. What, what, and I know you must feel a little bit guilty that you left before um, her passing, and it, I don't know what kind of facility is, but I don't know why you didn't have a nurse or a nurse didn't come in to evaluate her, because they are pretty good at giving time frames and telling you that, yes, we think that it's going to happen within, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry. But, but then again, remember, moms don't like to die in front of their children. So keep that in mind also. Thank you. I'm sorry it happened. Can you share how you became comfortable with death and talking about death and being by death and also advice for others about becoming more comfortable? Do you want to go out for a drink? We can spend a lot of time <laughs> talking about that. How I got involved in it to begin with is that I have always volunteered and worked in education. And when my daughter went off to college, I was really tired of education. I wanted to do something different. In my neighborhood newspaper, there was a little ad that said, we will train you to be a hospice volunteer. I knew it had to do with something medically, but I didn't understand what hospice was. And it was a very intense uh, weekend long, eight days, you know, eight hours a day, uh, session on uh, training me for hospice. I then w went to a hospital where they had an inpatient unit. It was for a different organization other than Journey Care, which I'm involved with now. And the nurses and the nursing assistants were phenomenal. They had me shadow them. I was just thrown right in and I was able to assist them and do all the things that you know, certified nursing assistants could do. I couldn't obviously distribute medication, but assist them with that. And I found out that I could actually do this. This is something that I could do. And I gained more and more confidence in it. And I am so honored to be a part of this because I felt like I would have been able to help some of my, my father, my mother-in-law, some other family members a, along the way. I, I just found I can do it. So it's again, it's part of the skill sets. I can't do legacy boxes. I'm not artistic. I'm not really musical. But this I found that I can do. I know that a number of people, when they suffer a loss, they want to immediately start volunteering you know, uh, in a hospice or a hospice setting. 
we usually don't allow them to do that for at least a year to after they process their own grief. So yes, you could go through the training, see if you're comfortable with that. I've read up a lot about things. This is a subject that interests me, and I found that I could do it. I hope that answered your question. Well, thank you so much for your talk and you. You know, the compassion that you have uh, able to communicate was you know, very comforting and, and, and pleasing to hear. Um, but I'd like to go back to an earlier question, and that was um, you, you have so much experience with the dying. I would like to hear your personal views on assisted suicide and from what you've observed, if it were available in Illinois, how you would respond to it. I'm not exactly sure. I do know that I don't want to linger. I want a fast death. I realize that after seeing a lot. So uh, that, that is a tough question, but I'm not opposed to it. But I don't know exactly how I, f how I personally would do that. But I have a feeling that it would be an option that I would not take off the table. Thank you for very, being very open about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your kind words. Uh, this is, I think, a quick one from uh, online. Are hospices for-profit or not-for-profit organizations? Or both. 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 Um, and, and that's another question to ask. As a matter of fact, uh, my hospice, Journey Care, has just been bought by a for-profit organization. It has changed the dynamic a little bit. I am very comfortable with nonprofits. I feel you should do whatever you can without worrying about the bottom line to help and assist people who are in the situation that needs the help. That's my personal opinion. I still, like I said, I'm on the volunteer advisory board. I still believe in um, journey care. I have a hospice patient right now that I go to their home. However, my attitude has changed slightly towards them because I want to see what care is being given to these people who need it without worrying about dollars and cents. So I'm very comfortable with nonprofits, but they are both. And that is a question that you can ask when uh, you are looking for a hospice for your loved ones. Um, so I have a question. You talked about mothers not wanting to die in front of their children, and I guess my question is sort of how much control at the end does somebody have over the timing, like in terms of, you know, hold on, so-and-so is on the plane, they'll be here, you know, by this afternoon, hold on, they're, you know, they're coming to say goodbye, or when, um, you know, like, um, when my father arrived to say goodbye to my grandmother, his mother, um, you know, and we told her to, you know, wait, Steve's coming, Steve's coming, um, and then her three sons, you know, gave her permission, like, it's okay, now you can go. Like, does that kind of thing matter? And, uh, you know, how much control does somebody uh, have? That's an interesting go? question, and I have seen that a lot, where, you know, again, I mentioned we're in a global society. We have people who don't, our loved ones may not live near us, and they are waiting. And we have, and, you know, we can whisper in their ear or the family member saying, well, someone is going to come in, they're going to be flying in, and we have seen people wait. So it's amazing what the body can do and the spirit can do. And sometimes that's very important to say those goodbyes and wait for those goodbyes. So time frame, I can't... I can't answer that, but I can say I have observed it, I have seen it, and I have seen after um, a, a couple came in from out of town uh, that they did talk to the mother and mother-in-law, and they said, we're here, we love you, and shortly thereafter she, she passed away. 
I've also had it where I was asked to sit a vigil and people were out, the daughter and her husband were out of town on a vacation and she was actively dying and I went to the nursing home to be with her and she died while I was there and didn't wait you know, for her daughter or her son-in-law to come in and they came a couple hours afterwards but I stayed with with the body. They couldn't, the daughter was hysterical, she couldn't walk into the room and she asked me to gather all the belongings. Sometimes, you know, they were inconsolable, the family members who just didn't make it. But once again, I just want to state what an honor and privilege it is for me to be with someone at their last breath and I have been with, and I've been asked this, uh, with almost a dozen people who have, who have died when I was there. And I've had a lot of grateful families who were so pleased that someone was with them. I put on that little cheat sheet, a newer organization that I'm not completely familiar with, but I heard a lot about. It's no one should die alone. And this organization is a foundation, and they're only, there's only 50 of them, uh, all total, in different parts of the United States, where they try to get people at the bedside uh, with that person so that person is not alone. The family members ask them to do that, so it's like giving uh, vigils. Also, believe it or not, they have this through this foundation. They will help pay for people who don't have enough money or are destitute, will help pay for funerals or other arrangements. So this is one that I, I will need to explore more. I've looked at their website. They look phenomenal. I just don't have enough information about them to impart. Thank you again so much for your presentation. Thank you. All right, and lastly, um, I'm going to share with you um, part of a an essay by um, Sarah Kerr, a death doula on expected death. When someone dies, the first thing to do is nothing. Don't run out and call the nurse. Don't pick up the phone. Take a deep breath and be present to the magnitude of the moment. There's a grace to being at the bedside of someone you love as they make their transition out of this world. At the moment that they take their last breath, there's an incredible sacredness in the space. The veil between the worlds opens. We're so unprepared and untrained in how to deal with death that sometimes a kind of panic response kicks in. They're dead. We knew they were going to die, so their being dead is not a surprise. It's not a problem to be solved. It's very sad, but it's not cause to panic. If anything, their death is caused to take a deep breath, to stop, and be really present to what's happening. If you're at home, maybe put on the kettle and make a cup of tea. Sit at the bedside and just be present to the experience in the room. What's happening for you? What might be happening for them? What other presences are here that may be, might be supporting them on their way? Tune into all the beauty and magic. Pausing gives your soul a chance to adjust because no matter how prepared we are, a death is still a shock. If we kick right into do mode and call 911 or call the hospice, we never get a chance to absorb the enormity of the event. Give yourself five minutes or 10 minutes, or 15 minutes just to be. You'll never get that time back again if you don't take it now. And there's more to that if you wanna find it online. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. <laughs>